Uh, Shabbat is supposed to be that which is uh, no work involved <laughs> and uh, not be stressful, but we'll put all that part behind us. Okay, so we're talking about the book of Leviticus, Vayikra. Let's not get bogged down in the details, but recognize and understand that the Yeshua is found in the detailed offerings, all of the mechanics, all of the maneuvers, all of the protocols of the Levitical priesthood. If we take the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, and cast it to the side and say, well, it's over my head, we're missing the great journey in finding out who Yeshua really is. Now, I mentioned uh, to some of you, may have seen it on uh, my earlier post, you're going to need a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to have an activity here in just a few minutes to, to help with an illustration and make a point. So uh, while you're listening, uh, either look around, see if you can find some paper or pen. We'll need that in a few minutes. So let's begin by reading the Yikra, Leviticus chapter number one, verse one, down through verse number nine. And Yahweh called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of appointment, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to Yahweh, you bring your offerings of the livestock, of the herd, or of the flock. And, excuse me, if his offering is an ascending offering of the herd, let him bring a male, a perfect one. Let him bring it to the door of the tent of appointment for his acceptance before Yahweh. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the ascending offering, and it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And he shall slay the bull before Yahweh, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around of the slaughter place, which is at the door of the tent of appointment. And he shall skin the ascending offering and cut it into its pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the slaughter place and lay the wood in order on the fire. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall arrange the pieces with the head and the fat on the wood which is on the fire of the slaughter place. But its entrails and its legs he washes with water. And the priest shall burn all of it on the slaughter place as an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. From inside the Ochel Moed, the, the tent of appointment, the place of meeting, Yah calls to Moshe to give him instructions on bringing what's called in the Hebrew a korbanot to him. A korbanot is normally translated in our English versions as either sacrifice which denotes we give that which we can't afford, we give sacrificially, or it's an offering. That is, we take from the abundance that we have, we select a portion, and we hand it over to Yah. Neither one really convey what korban or korbanot for the plural really means. The word korban means more appropriately drawing near. It is the mechanism, it is the means of drawing near, uh, making a near approach to someone. In this case, Yah is saying that this offering, this particular offering, an ascending offering, an elevation offering it's called, it's the whole or the burnt offering. It's the offering that is mentioned in Romans chapter number, number 12 and verse number 1 that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Yah. The idea there is that you present yourself. The Hebrew word here is ola, O-L-A-H, we would transliterate it. An ola, I am given my entire being. It is called a whole or a burnt offering as all of it is consumed on the altar and there is nothing left over. These instructions were not to be relayed primarily to the priest, but the target audience of what Yah is, is trying to instruct is the people, the people at large of Am Israel. 
So we should then ascertain that Yah wants you and I to bring a korban, a near approaching to him. Now, obviously, we're not going to follow the protocols and go slay a bull or a, a ram or a goat or a lamb or turtle doves even. We don't have a temple. We don't have a standing priesthood. We don't have the protocols in place. Um, but there is something to be learned about our Messiah through this entire process. Through the details and the blueprints of the tabernacle, we should hear Yah's voice calling to us. Moshe has just erected the tabernacle, and he has just anointed every implement of the tabernacle. And the Shekinah of Yahweh, his glory, his manifested presence, has so filled this place that Moshe is unable to enter in. And standing there seeing the spectacle of all that is this tabernacle system, Yah's voice comes calling to him from over the mercy seat at the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, you tell my people that when they want to approach me, this is how they are to approach me. He has designed a particular system of a functional worship that will facilitate our approaching him, drawing near to him and receiving a revelation of who he really is. It's very simply stated, folks. Yah wants you and I close to him. He wants us to follow the altar of sacrifice, or as I call it, the altar of transformation as the beginning of that process. You can't proceed to the Ark of the Covenant or to the menorah or to the table of showbread until you first have come to the altar of sacrifice. So it's repulsive to us and our modern day wisdom and world perspective we would say, I just don't understand why all that sacrifice stuff is necessary, especially now that Yeshua has hung on the tree. Why do I even care about how to slay an animal and place it on the altar? What is it about animal blood, about burning fat and flesh going up in smoke that makes Yah want you and I to approach him? First, let's remember that the physical realm reveals the spiritual realm. And while we might look at this scene and just simply see an animal dying and giving its blood and being placed on a large fire on an altar, what's really taking place here is a lot more significant and a lot more important. Let's also remember that the people that are being offered this protocol of approaching are the same ones who had panicked at the Reed Sea, who claimed it would have been better for them to die in Mitzrayim than to die free people in the wilderness, who complained about water, who complained about food, who complained about the food that Yah fed them, who wondered if Yah is with them or not, and who just recently has built and constructed a gold calf in order to bring mixture in their worship of Yah. This is not a people with a lot of good credentials after their name. These are a people that have demonstrated failure after failure after failure, and Yah says to them, I still want you. I still desire your closeness and your presence being drawn near to me. We must understand that Yah is not saying to us, stay away from me until you learn to do better, until you learn to behave. He is calling out to us as a dysfunctional, wayward, and even an immature people to learn to come to him, to approach him, and to draw near to him, to learn to experience him so that they and we can have a fruitful and enjoyable life. Experiencing Yah is our answer. I want to say that again. Experiencing Yah is our answer. And that is what we're longing for. 
Today, I want to talk to you about embracing the experience. We must embrace the process. We must learn the, the propriety of protocol and become changed by it, understanding the cost of his presence to realize who he really is and genuinely experience him. I, I would say that I've experienced him, but there's a level of experience that I'm still hungering for. I'm not satisfied with the degree of experiencing and embracing him in the past. I want more. I want to know him more. If then the protocol requires animals, death, blood, and flesh, let's find out why. Why was this necessary? So to begin to understand this, we go all the way back to the garden. So number one, let's talk about the prototype of this offering, the korban, that is found in the garden. The word says that Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, that they they had fellowship with Yah. He walked in the garden in the cool of the day. They had a right, maybe we would say a righteous relationship with him. Sin had not entered the picture. But we know that notorious and infamous chapter number three, where they were led to believe that as wonderful as things were, Yah was somehow holding out on them. Can you imagine that? Hasatan, Satan, caused them to consider that they could be as Yahweh, that they could have a relationship with him that was not subservient, but that was equal. And that's still the yearning and the desire of mankind, even in our day. We know that we cannot be with Yah as the scripture describes him, not as an equal we are still his creation, but if we can redefine him, if we can reevaluate him, if we can dilute him in some means, then we can find equality with him. But then what kind of power, what kind of being, what kind of creator would we actually have? This lie led to the sin that brought about separation, brought about servitude, and brought about shame. When man began to misunderstand Yahweh, when man began to try to redefine the relationship with him on their own terms, it did not bring liberty or freedom, it did not bring power, it did not bring greater depth of understanding. It brought a lie. It brought deception. It brought death. Outside the garden where they then found themselves, man was naked. He found himself ashamed. Now, he had just recently been unclothed and unashamed. No embarrassment, no humiliation. But the man that was covered in the glory of Elohim now stands unclothed, ashamed, embarrassed, uncovered, humbled. Everything has fallen apart for him. The word says in chapter number three of Bereshit or Genesis that Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh, the name of mercy, Elohim, the name of judgment, judgment and mercy work together. The judgment was man is fallen in his estate and he can't heal himself. Mercy acted with that judgment, and Yah took an animal and brought its skin to bring covering for mankind. The word says that Yah made a covering of skin for them. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument whether that skin is what you and I see right here. The thing is, man was naked. Whatever he was covered in, it was an embarrassing thing to be seen in his estimation. Yah made a covering. Most translations say he made an articles of clothing for them. So Yah, it was the one who made covering. What was Yah's definition of man then at this point? 
when Yah looked at man, was he saying, well, these are those that have sinned against me. These are those that have angered me. These are those that are now separated from me. Was he looking at them in such negative terms? Or was he looking at Adam and Chava and saying, these are those whom I will restore to me? These are those that though they are now separate and outside my garden, these are those that will live with me in my garden one more time. They, I will bring them back to the garden. Yeah, this is a simple message. This is not very complicated. The words detail, but this message is very simple today. And what I want you to understand is regardless of your situation, your circumstances, your fears, your failures, your past history, Yah does not look at you in anger and in rejection with loathing, but rather he is seeing us with potential, with a destiny. He's seeing you and I with power, an anointing, a fresh gifting. He is seeing you and I as restorable. Whatever's going on in your life, you are not beyond restoration. You're not beyond hope. You're not beyond redemption. It is not you, but it is the power of Yeshua in you that can bring you to a place where you can be restored even to the garden. Whenever Adam and Chava saw these skin coverings that Yah himself had made for them, they remembered the act of his compassion. And they remembered the fact, I didn't make these, Yah made these for me. They should have also remembered the animal that lost its life to provide a covering for them. An animal substituted for them. Now, in spite of all of our stuff, can I tell you that we are the ones that Yah has chosen to approach him? Let's think about this. Let's go all the way back to the patriarchs. Avram was called out to seek and to find Yah in the land. Yah said, come out and walk with me, and I will show you this land. I will give you this land. Avram, Avram, Avraham, as he became, had multiple life experiences. He had multiple choices, good and bad, that led him to Yah revealing himself to him more and more. Can I tell you that not only was it after the good choices that he made, but at times after the bad choices that he made, that the Father revealed himself to him. Wherever Abraham went, the scripture shows he built an altar and he called on the name of Yud Hey Vav Hey. That meant that he slaughtered animals. He shed their blood. He placed their bodies on a burning pile of wood. The smoke went up and he would have found acceptance in the eyes of Yah. When the blood was spilled, he was not just killing an animal. But the word says that life is in the blood. He was releasing the life of the animal. And as that life was given up, life was also given to him. He offered them to Yah as a means of a korban, a near approaching. Yah, even to the patriarchs, was being approached before the Levitical system ever came into being. Mankind was drawing near to Yah through their carbonot, their korban. Yitzhak and Yaakov also built altars and offered korbanot or near approaching offerings to Yah. And Yah received them and accepted them. Now I'm going to throw something in in a parenthesis here. There is coming a day in our near future, I believe, that a temple would be built on the Temple Mount in Israel, in Jerusalem. A Levitical priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, will begin to function. 
Now, whether they wait until they have the entirety of the temple complex erected, whether they build the altar first, maybe it's even on a foundation stone. But at some point in our future, the Levitical priesthood, the Kohanim, the sons who are descendants of Aaron, are going to present animals for sacrifice on that altar. And PETA and the world over, they're going to go nuts. They're not going to accept this. Those uh, who are standing in pulpits all over America are going to point a finger toward the east and condemn this. But if you read in the book of Daniel, you will find, I believe, in chapter number 10, that it is the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist, who is the one who puts a stop to it. It's called the daily tamid, the daily continual offering. A lamb at nine in the morning, a lamb at three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's not Elohim, it's not Yah, it's not Yeshua that stops this. It is the anti-Messiah. When that temple is erected, whether you understand the necessity of the offerings, whether you understand the need of the Levitical priesthood or not, <clears throat> do not point your finger in accusation against it, lest you partner with the one who causes the, the sacrifices to stop. More on that for another teaching. Deliverance was understood to bring Am Israel into the wilderness where they would worship Yahweh. Yah said to Moshe, tell Pharaoh, then my people must be released to come out in the wilderness to worship me. They must come out for three days journey, and there they will worship me. Well, Yah was not just thinking about our traditional church services, where there would be a choir and a special song and an offering and a sermon and an altar call, and then we'd all pack up and go back to Mitzrayim. That's not what he had in mind. That's not what he had in mind at all. Yah knew that he was going to have to teach his people the protocols of worship. He was going to have to teach them how to approach him in an acceptable way. The tabernacle is the acceptable means of approaching him. That includes what we're reading about in the book of Leviticus of Vayikra. And Shemot, or Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. The word says, And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. A reign of priests. Yah intended all along to, for Israel to function in a priesthood, a priesthood who would worship at an altar and present offerings that would be acceptable to him. That was his plan all along. In the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7, it says, Yahweh did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more numerous than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. Verse 8 says, But because Yahweh loves you, and because of him guarding the oath which he swore to your fathers, that's why he chose us. Yah loves us. Now, I know most of us understand that in theory. Most of us understand the, the wide scope, basic concept, well, God is love, Yah is love, and I know he loves me. But do you really understand he really, really loves you? We get so used and accustomed for family, spouses, looking at us and say, love you. We say that so ca casually. But there, it would do you, you husbands a great deal of good if you would honestly and sincerely take a moment, pause, and look into your wife's eyes and with emotion and passion say, I love you. Now, would she be suspicious as to what you might have just bought? I don't know. That's up to you. 
but she needs to understand and know that you love her. Yah is trying to say to you and I through the pages of this, this scripture, I love you and I want you to come close to me. I want you to approach me. When any one of you, he says, brings a korban to Yahweh, you bring your korban of the livestock, of the herd, or of the flock. If his korban is an ola, an ascension, elevation offering, let him bring. And then he gives us the details of the bringing. An ola, an elevation offering. This says, I want to be close to him. I want to elevate my walk before him. I want to ascend before him and be close to him. Therefore, I bring the animal that I can most afford, and I bring it to him, whether it's a bull or whether it's a goat or whether it's turtle doves. He brings that which he can, he can put his hands on and bring. And then here is the key. What is it about the animal, its blood, its flesh, its burning, being transformed into ashes and smoke? What is that? Here's the process. The man takes his hands and he lays it on the head of the animal. One hand is laid on the animal, and then it says, <clears throat> he shall slay. Now, if you read the, the text here, it's not the, uh, the Aaronic priesthood. It's not the Kohanim, the priest who do this. But the man lays his hand on the animal. He then cuts the throat of that animal. It's the priest who catch the blood. It's the priest who put the blood against the sides of the altar. Then we continue to read, and it says, that the man will take the animal and he will skin the animal. He slays and then he skins the animal and he cuts it in its particular pieces. Then the Aaronic priesthood takes it and puts it on the altar. The man goes through more than a process of walking through the gate with an animal and saying, here it is. It's for me. I'll see you later. The man is involved in the entire process. That man has his hands on the head until the blood drains out enough that the animal sinks to the forelegs and he sinks further down. He feels the life flowing out of this animal. And when the animal's life has been consumed and been fully let out, and its blood has been caught. While that blood is being applied to the altar, this man is cutting the hide and the skin off of this animal. And then this man is dissecting the pieces. And then the, the, the priest, the Kohanim, they take the parts and they present it after they have been washed and laid it on the altar in the man's behalf. We have been erroneously taught, just yell at the heavens. Just cry out. Just say his name. And everything is fixed and everything is fine. You and I both know that in order to find him, there is an involvement of seeking for him. In order for him to open the door to us, there's a knocking at his door. In order for us to, to find his heart, there's got to be a searching for his heart. I can't just sit here and pray a casual prayer and not really be involved in my heart and expect that heaven will open up and the glory of Elohim will fall down upon me and radically change my life. There's never been an outbreak of revival anywhere in the world where there hasn't been a price of prayer and fasting and seeking him that has gone on beforehand. Yah wants to meet with us. Yah is wanting to call to us. The very word Vayikra means an appointed calling. I call to an appointed time. 
Vayakar, a very similar word, means it just happens upon us. God's not just happening upon us. He is intentionally engaging us. He is pursuing us more than we're pursuing him. Now, I want you to come down to this activity. If you got that piece of paper, you got your pen, <coughs> here's what I want you to do. And I've done it ahead of time to give you a little bit of an example. I'll try to show this for you in a moment. I want you to take this piece of paper and, and write down a list of things that you believe define you, such as in your life experiences, both the good and the bad. Now, I'll hold mine up. Hopefully you can see this. You can see that I put here that I was raised in a good home, that I grew up in a Pentecostal church, uh, my high school experiences, and you'll see Laura's name there with a couple of exclamation part, um, marks on there, marriage, raising kids, the church pastoral life part, and the good and the bad that came out of that. You'll see right here, Mike Clayton with his name underlined. <laughs> You're welcome, Mike. Thank you, Mike. There's a lot of things, good and bad, that have happened in my life. And I've listed them here. These are my life experiences. And when you've gotten down to the end of this, I want you to draw a line. And underneath this line, write your name. These are the life experiences that if you were to add them all up, this is who I am. This is what life or who life and life experiences have created me to be. I'm shaped and formed and designed by all of these things. Now, there may be parts that the Father has included in me, established in me, sown in me, that I'm not even aware of. They too defined who I am, but who I see in the mirror, what I see in the mirror is defined by this list. And at the bottom, that's who I am. Now, maybe you would write out to the side, <coughs> you would write out to the side of your name, a disclaimer and say failure or not who I should be not satisfied, depressed, I'm anxious, I'm upset, I'm, I couldn't be any better if I tried. You, 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 may, you may feel like that you deserve a, a list of gold stars after your name. But this is who you are. Can I tell you that who you are, according to this list, good or bad, it's not enough to just simply walk up to him and say, here I am. There is a protocol. There is a means of near approaching to him. How do we get there? How can I find him? Well, go underneath your name and put a plus sign. And beside the plus sign, ever how you would transliterate it, write the name Yeshua Draw a line underneath that. And once you do that underneath the sum total of you plus Yeshua, you can write such things as Israel. When Yeshua comes into my life, I am now Israel. I don't replace anyone who is Israel before me or who's also Israel, but I become a part of. I am redeemed. I'm restored. I'm worthy. I'm loved. I'm accepted. One word for sure that I want you to write under there is you are restorable. You can be restored. You're not a reject. Yah doesn't hate you. Yah is not looking away from you. His eyes are upon you. When you come to him 
with Yeshua. Through Yeshua, you are loved, you're accepted, you're a part of his kingdom, you're included in his kingdom, and the Father has something that he wants to offer unto you. Now, there is a problem with the altar. Let's be very, very real here. At the altar, even the altar of sacrifice, even with blood involved, even with the loss of animal life involved, even with the skinning and the cutting into pieces and all of the intricates of the protocol, even with all of that, there is a problem with it. It can, like anything else in our life, become routine. And Yeshua, and uh, Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, chapter number 1, verse 11 through 13. Yah says, of what use to me are your many slaughterings, declares Yahweh. I have had enough of ascending offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Would you come to be, appear before me? Who has required this from your hand to trample my courtyards? Stop bringing futile offerings and incense. It is an abomination to me. New moons, Shabbats, the calling of gatherings, I am unable to bear unrighteousness and assembly. He says, continuing on in that chapter, when you spread out your hands to me, they're filled with blood. I'm rejecting you, not because of the offering, but because of your heart and your attitude. Yah would never reject his Shabbats, but the way they were going about Shabbat and the casual attitude they had toward it, it was meaningless to them, therefore it was meaningless to Yah. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 21 through 23, Yah says, I have hated, I have despised your festivals, and I am not pleased with your assemblies. Though you offer me ascending offerings and your grain offerings, I do not accept them, nor do I look on your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, and we thought we sounded good. For I do not hear the sound of your stringed instruments. You have to wonder how many times a choir is sung, a priest team has led worship, someone has got up and played a beautiful song and sang it wonderfully, and Yah was deaf to it because the heart was not in it. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 10, who among you would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my slaughter place for naught or for nothing? I have no pleasure in you, says Yahweh of hosts, nor do I accept an offering from your hands. Now, there would be those that would say, well, see there, that means that he has rejected the Levitical system. No, not at all. God's the one who gave these systems of approaching him. Yah is the designer of the protocols. Yah is the one who drew out the blueprints for the Mishkan. And Yah is the one who accepted the offerings that were offered there. So we know that they work. And Yah never changes his mind. He does not change what he's accepted in the past. He will again accept in the future. And again, that's, a, that's another teaching. But it's not the animals and their blood it was not the Levites and their priesthood that he was rejecting. Yah was not rejecting the process, but he was rejecting the hearts of men who bring offerings that no longer affect them, even in what they're doing. So they had learned the routine. I take the animal, I put my hand on the animal, I, I, I cut the animal's throat, I skin the animal, I cut it in pieces, I hand it to the priest, and I walk away. It really doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I'm just appeasing him and hoping that he will stay on good terms with me and not be angry with me. Yah's not looking to be appeased. Yah's looking to be approached. Yah's default response to us and demeanor toward us is not that of anger and judgment but rather one of compassion and the showing of mercy 
But he's looking for a people that will approach him with a whole heart to receive that. How many of you as parents, when your children come to you and they just understand, if I ask, mom's going to hand me out a, a handful of money and let me go have a good time. They'll never say thank you. They bring the car back with no gas in it. They, they sleep all day the next day. They don't do what you asked them to do. And then they come back with their hand out again. At some point, we say, now, wait a minute. We need to back up and reevaluate this lesson and this, this relationship that we have. You don't appreciate who I am, and you're not appreciating what I'm doing for you. God does the same for us. He's expecting that your heart and our heart would be in right relationship with him and that we would come expecting, yes, but also worshiping and acknowledging and understanding I'm not worthy. If I hadn't had the ability to add Yeshua to the life experience total of who I am, I have no means of approaching you. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, does Yahweh delight in ascending offerings and slaughterings as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Look, to obey is better than a slaughtering. To heed is better than the fat of rams. In verse 23, because you rejected the word of Yah, he is also rejecting you. Yah is not looking to see how big an animal you can bring as much as he's looking to see what how big your heart is toward him. All of these offerings, all of these animals, they all pointed to Yeshua. In the future, in the kingdom, when the priesthood is restored and offerings are offered up again, they will point back to Yeshua and what they, what Yeshua did for them. Whether we're looking toward Yeshua or looking back on what Yeshua has done, the animals offered are an off, offering to glorify and reveal Yeshua. But how can we claim that we know him and that we're called by his name and that we have a personal relationship with him if we don't live as he lives? Sitting on the porch a little while ago, my wife, Laura, was reading the details of of Leviticus 1 through 5, Vayigra 1 through 5, and she was asking the question, what do the entrails have to do with anything? It, It is a bit frustrating to look at all the details and wonder, well, how does this apply to me? What do animal entrails say to me? Well, let's back up. When I lay my hand on the animal and the throat is cut and I feel the blood leaking away and the life ebbing out, I realize Yeshua gave all of his life for me. When the animal is being skinned, I realize the covering of the hide of the skin is Yeshua's covering over me. I take on the appearance of Yeshua, for I wear his skin. I wear his covering. So that it's not me that is seen, but Yeshua. Rav Shul, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Messiah, and yet I live, yet not I, but it is now Messiah who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I I live by faith in him who loved me and gave himself for me. So much so that the world doesn't see me. Honestly, they're going to recognize who I am. They're going to see the outside of me. But what comes from the inside of me doesn't need to be my thoughts and understandings. It needs to be that of my Messiah. We must never allow Yeshua to become routine to us, but be freshly covered in him. So what about the entrails? I'll try to answer Laura's question. The inner organs is the functionality of Yeshua's body. While I'm presenting this to you, my lungs are receiving air and exhaling. My heart is being beating. My liver is functioning. Hallelujah. Uh, my stomach is digesting food. Uh, my intestines are breaking down food to their, to their nutrition of the body. The blood systems are functioning. 
All of my inner organs are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hallelujah. It makes me healthy and it makes me strong. When I take on the the entrails of Yeshua, the inner organs of Yeshua, I ain't taking his functionality. I ain't taking the functionality of his life into me. When I discern the pieces, the meat, it even says the washing of the legs, and they're placed on there. I'm receiving his walk and learning to walk as he walks to take the steps that Messiah requires of me. So in the book of Leviticus, by Yikra, there are five principal uh, uh, offerings, korbanot, korban, that are here. Chapter number one is the Ola. It's the elevation and the ascension offering. Yeshua is my Ola. In Ephesians chapter two and verse six, it says he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua then is the means by which I arise up. He is the lifting up of my life. He is the elevation of my being before the Most High. And I find myself in the presence of the Most High only through Him. In chapter number two, we look at the mincha, the meal offering, the grain offering, that talks to us about our very essence of life, the strength of our life, the staple of our life. Uh, it is the worship that it comes out of us in thanksgiving for Yah giving us life. And Yochanan in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the word says that the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Yeshua says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it in great abundance. My life is found in Yeshua. His energy, his cause of being, his consideration, the functions of his mind, the essence of his being, it now becomes part of me. Yeshua is my minka, my grain offering. In chapter number three, we talk about the shalomim, the peace offering. The whole, uh, it, it, shalomim is taken from the word shalom, and it doesn't just mean the absence of that which is violent. We did have war, but now we have peace. Now, what we're talking about here is shalom. And you can have shalom right in the middle of warfare. Shalom says that everything is whole. Everything is complete. And that everything is as it's supposed to be. Nothing is missing. Nothing is broken. I find that in Yeshua. You will also find this in the words of Ephesians chapter number 2. And let's go there and read verses 13 through 16. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace, our shalom, who has made both one, that is that which was two, is now become whole and complete, made one. And having broken down the partition of the barrier, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the Torah of the commands and dogma, so as to create in himself one renewed man from the two, thus making shalom or peace, and, verse 16, to completely restore to favor both of them unto Elohim and one body through the stake, having destroyed the enmity by it, that which was divided, the house of Yehuda, the Jews, and the house of Ephraim, those of us who have come out of a Gentile background. That's not that's who we used to be. That's not who we are any longer. We're made one in Messiah. There is shalom between us in Messiah. How are we ever going to reconcile with the Jews? And how are they ever going to reconcile with us, Yeshua? But they don't believe in Yeshua. Folks, just hold on. They accept the Torah. We accept Messiah. When you take the Torah and the Messiah together and you realize that they're one, there's the potential of being echad, being made one. Hallelujah, looking forward to that day. So Yeshua is my Shalomim offering. Chapter 4 is the katat, the sin offering. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. 
For he made him, Yah made Yeshua, who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of Elohim. Now, I'm giving you one scripture for each of these. There are a multitude of scriptures, and you can find them. But Yeshua did not know sin, yet he became as sin for us. That is, he carried our sins to the tree, and they were nailed there with him. His blood filled, spilled over them, and it was a, an atonement for us. Chapter 5 is the Asham offering, the trespass offering. My sins are between me and Yah. My trespasses are between me and you. And that our trespass offering, we look to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8. For the transgression, for the trespass of my people, he was stricken. <clears throat> verse 10. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him. He laid sickness on him. <clears throat> that when he made himself the Hebrew here says an asham, a guilt offering, a trespass offering. He would see a seed. Yeshua saw himself as the trespass offering. The purpose of Yeshua dying, among many things, was to bring reconciliation between ourselves and our Creator through him and between ourselves and our fellow man, our brother, through him. Yeshua said it very plainly, how can you say that you love your brother whom you have seen, or say that you love your father whom you have not seen, and say that you love your brother, or you hate your brother that you have seen? I'll get that straight. Yeshua is asking you and I to not only come to him with a right heart toward him, but that we have a right heart to one another. He also instructed us, if you bring your gift and you realize that your brother has an ought against you, leave your gift at the altar, go make it right with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift. In teaching us to pray, he said, if you do not forgive others of their trespasses against you, neither will your trespasses be forgiven you. How I treat you, how you treat me, how we treat others, affects the offering that we bring. And we might say, well, you know, remember we wrote plus Yeshua and he takes care of all of that. But we also acknowledge our failures. On this list that I drew up, there are some things that I didn't go into detail, not publicly, but there's some, there's some dirty laundry there. There are some things that I'm not proud of there. And just writing Yeshua over it doesn't mean that it all goes away. I have to confess those things. I have to deal with those things. I have to be real with them. But in the being real with them and confessing and declaring, then I'm able to write plus Yeshua and he atones for me. Because I'm honest or you're honest and are approaching the altar and we do it with a whole heart, Yah will receive us. Yah will accept us. Yah will redeem us. Yah will restore us. I don't know about you. Yes, I do. I do know about you. You do want to be restored as much as I do. I don't want to live on the outskirts. I don't want to stand on the outside looking in. I want to be a part of all that the Father has given to us and is doing in us. And I believe that's what you want as well. Don't deny the offerings. Embrace what they're saying to us. Find Yeshua in them. And in doing so, we're going to have a more meaningful relationship with our Creator. Amen. Thank you so much for your time, for listening in, for putting up with some technical issues at the beginning. <clears throat> if you will hold with me for a moment. I'd like to offer the Aaronic blessing over you. And then we'll sing the Shema together. <clears throat> Will you receive the blessing of his name? 
Ivarekaka Yahweh Vaishma Reka Yaher Yahweh Panavi Leka Vikuneka Isa Yahweh Panavi Leka Vyasim Laka Shalom. And may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious and favorable to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you that he may grant to you. Shalom. Wherever you're at, where you turn and face toward the east, toward Jerusalem, for me, it's right in that direction. Sing this ancient song with me. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevud, Malkutu, Le'alam Va'ed, Amen.